Okay, welcome to the Von Cash Show. Happy Friday, everybody. Uh, today, I got guests with me. Her name is Saz. We'll be talking about tattoos, ayahuasca trips, being an esthetician, and a makeup artist in the adult industry. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you. How about you? How are you? Doing well. Happy belated birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. 45. Do anything... Uh, hey, you can't tell. Um, did you do anything fun? I worked, which I love oh. my job. So yeah, I guess it's fun. Okay. I worked yeah. on my birthday too. I, I feel that. <laughs> um, yeah. So how I met you was at my work. I ran into you and in the short time we had to interact, I was like, wow, she is really cool, really cool tattoos and seems like you have an interesting story. And that's why we are here today. So thank you for being on the show and taking your time out of your Friday. Absolutely. I really appreciate it too. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing I noticed, I remember you were on my line, rang you up. I'm like, whoa, you have a really cool neck tattoo. And from what I remember, it was the silence of the lamb. Was it like a, it's a bee or a moth? I forget. Yeah. The moth. Okay. When did you first start getting tattooed? Exactly when I turned 18. Okay. I knew I was right after my birthday. Okay. Uh, What made you decide to dive into tattoos? Well, it's actually something that I realized recently why I started getting tattoos. When I was 18, I thought, oh, this is just cool. I want to get it. I want to be seen as tough but Mm -hmm. recently a memory came to me and this is like 30 something years later that um, I had a really tumultuous relationship with my dad when I was younger him being Iranian and me being Iranian American growing up here um, we didn't really see eye to eye and he had this friend who was a female and she was tattooed and she rode motorcycles and she was an artist and he admired her. And I think that somehow that went into my subconscious deep. And I thought that if I became this woman, that maybe my dad would admire me too, or even just like me, because it's hard for, um, we grew up Muslim and I know a lot of people will disagree with me, but as far as my family and my culture, the women weren't really seen as, um, I don't know, valuable. They were more seen as domestic, and and I didn't see myself that way. I saw myself more as a fighter and an artist and a rebel, and I thought maybe if I get these tattoos, my dad will see me the same. But And it's just a memory that recently came to me. So it was pretty, pretty shocking for okay. myself to realize that. No, that's that's a lot of work must have been done to figure that realization out. I mean, that's pretty deep. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, yeah, you know, um, yeah, no. For me, I think I, I remember growing up. I used to look at the tattoo magazines. I thought that was pretty cool, and I think I I felt like I was I was like a kind of like a rebel growing up. Nothing like I was doing super crazy anything super crazy, but I just felt like I didn't fit in. And I was like, Oh, you know, and I was, I'm a fan of art. And over time it came into my head, like, Oh, when you turn 18, you can get tattoos. I just moved out. You know, I'm 18 now. I think I got mine at 19, but, uh, as cheesy as it sounds, Miami Inc was like, yo, I'm getting tattoos. These are cool. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because we don't know why we do it. And then we realize our origin story later in life. Yeah, definitely. And I don't regret getting tattoos now. I remember just having to hide them. I know my parents weren't a big fan. I don't know if they really are now. I just they accept it. But I got most of them out of my legs. And for 10 years, I would wear pants at family parties, regardless of the weather. Even at the beach. <laughs> I know exactly how that goes. Yeah. I did the same. I would wear things to always cover them up. Yeah. So you said you grew up Iranian. Iranian. Um, what was it like just growing up uh, in that culture with tattoos and being 
you identify as more like defiant and rebellious? It was really tough. I think at the time I didn't think it was that tough, but in retrospect, looking back on it, I realized that I was kind of casted out of a lot of groups that thought that maybe my tattoos equaled um, gang violence or promiscuity or things like that, which, I mean, whether it did or not, I I don't think it should have mattered to them, but I did get ostracized a lot. And um, I went to a school where there weren't a lot of Iranian uh, students. There were a lot of kids bust in from inner cities. So it felt right until I was no longer in that environment. And then I felt like, oh, God, did I make a mistake? Or we just always outcasted. And now I look at it, and it's so popular for the Iranians in um, Europe and even in Iran to get tattoos and be a little bit more rebellious. And I see that my parents are more accepting of it when their own culture has accepted it. But I'm thinking, okay. Me and my sisters did this 30 years ago when it was completely looked down upon. Because a lot of Iranians believe that tattoos were, uh, the origin of it is from prisons, which isn't really the case. It's it's from tribes. But they really do believe that you're kind of like the low life of society. And knowing that I wasn't, and I was really smart in school, and I was generally a nice person it kind of messed with self-identity a lot right yeah going back to what you said with the origins of tattoos it does come from tribes and has indigenous history um but i do remember you know 20 years ago tattoos were kind of seen as like a criminal thing i think across many cultures right so i totally get that part um Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think my family now is more accepting of it. I think in general society, I feel like overall, for the most part, is more accepting of it than it was, I don't know, 20 years ago. You know, I remember back then it was kind of like certain people only had tattoos, but now it's very more, it's more accepted, which is great. It doesn't label you as a bad person. Right. And, and, And that comes down to simplified words. You just labeled as a bad person if you got any sort of artistry on your body, which was so right. ironic. Yeah. And also too, I feel like, I don't know, a religious thing too. Uh, I mean, I grew up Catholic. I don't practice it, but I do know that it's kind of shunned in, um, in religion because it's like, you know, your creator made you as is you're perfect. Why would you kind of like defile your temple quote unquote, you know? So there was that too. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, I guess that could be kind of torn apart in different ways too. Yeah. But I do feel I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no. I was saying when Catholics drink, so defying the temple could be inside or outside, but yeah. Yeah. It it could be looked at as a lot of stuff that (laughs) doesn't make sense. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not religious, but I feel like if, if there was religion out there, like one or whatever, I feel like if you're a good person and you do right to the best of your ability, I feel like some designs in your skin is not going to make a big difference. It's not going to make a huge difference. No, it's how you, how you treat somebody when you have the power to treat them badly. Do you choose to treat them badly or do you choose to treat them good? Whether or not you have that ability. So yeah, I don't think designs on your skin really make a difference no okay so did you know what you wanted to do growing up as a career you said you were good in school and whatnot i wanted to be an actor from the time that i was in kuwait i was born in kuwait and i was watching i think mickey mouse club or kids incorporated it was one of those way back then and I'd never seen anything like it before, kids singing and dancing. And I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. Unfortunately, I couldn't sing. And so I didn't really have that to fall on. And then, of course, my uh, my dad thought that it was 
such a, I mean, I, I guess the plain and simple, he just said, that's a whore's job. And that comes from that deep seated Islamic mentality of women aren't really supposed to be flamboyant in any way. And as soon as you are, and singing and dancing is a form of being flamboyant, uh, then you, it, it just automatically, automatically equates to you being sexually promiscuous. So now that I'm older, I look back on it and I think it's absolutely silly that everything uh, kind of goes right back to sexuality, which I guess then makes you think whose mind is really dirty here. The one that's constantly equating things right back to it. Not that sexuality is anything bad, but in, in their, in their equation. But yeah, so he, he wasn't okay with that at all. And I, I tried still, I tried to go in that direction, but I, I think without the support of my family, I just wasn't strong enough to, to pursue that. So I knew I liked makeup. So I fell back on makeup. Okay. No, that's, that's an interesting story. I, I, I don't know too much about the Islamic culture, but I do know it might, it's kind of on the more conservative side, but I think it can be said the same for other religions too. And it's like on the more conservative side, I can see that in, you know, Christianity, Catholicism. So I don't think it's just Islam, but I get that, you know, um, you make a good point where it's like, if you keep associating things with sexuality, like who is, who, who has a dirty mind at the end of the day? I mean, that's a good point. Right. Exactly. It's like you, you're constantly projecting this thought onto others, but the projection is coming from you. So, right. I mean, where, where's, where's the, the starting point? Of that? But again, that's one of the reasons I, I denounced my religion. It just wasn't something for me. Right. Yeah. Agree. Um, my family practices Catholicism. I'm cool with it. It's not my thing. I attend church, you know, when I'm I'm with them. That's about it. I, I go for them, really. But yeah. Uh, and and okay, you're Filipino. So, yes, yes, I am. Is that the main religion amongst Filipinos? Is yes, it is. Yeah, I'd say Philippines is like over fifty percent Catholic. Maybe like sixty, yeah. seventy, maybe eighty. Yeah, it's it's has a big influence due to the, you know, Spain colonizing Philippines mm -hmm. for over a couple hundred years. So, th for the most part, many Filipinos are devout Catholics for the most part. So, yeah, okay. it's uh, deep, deep, deeply ingrained. <laughs> um, Fingers. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, so you're a makeup artist and an esthetician. Did I say that right? Esthetician? Esthetician, yeah. <laughs> at, at, wait, esthetician? <laughs> esthetician. Esthetician. Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> uh, okay, I just thought of something funny. I'll mention it later as we okay. go down the topics. Esthetician. Okay. Esthetician. Okay, what came first for you? The makeup came first. Okay. And then I think that in... In searching for jobs in the makeup industry, I naturally went over to salons and I realized that a lot of them required a California license in order to work there. So I thought that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in a salon. So went and got my license. Yeah. I make it okay. sound easy. It was 600 hours. <laughs> that's a lot of time. Okay. And then <laughs> what is it? What is the Esthetician. It's a skincare therapist. I like that. So they can um, broke it down. This dermatologist. Okay. Or so facial. What made you want to pick that one up as well? Or did it come hand in hand? Yeah, I felt like it came hand in hand. I felt like I wanted to further my education in order to make more money and be able to have more opportunities in that field. So I went back to school did my 600 hours and I took the state board exam and I'm not working in a salon now, but I do feel like the education did help me. It furthered my understanding of what I'm doing and it just makes people more comfortable knowing that you are educated in that field. If you're going to work on their skin. Right. I agree a hundred percent. What 
was the schooling process like those 600 hours? Can you describe what that was like for you? I actually really, really liked it. And I didn't think that I would growing up, just always wanted to, wanting to do some sort of art. Um, I didn't think that I would like anatomy and physiology and biology and chemistry and all of those things were included. I mean, of course, a very light version of it. It wasn't like a college course, but I really enjoyed learning the bones of the body and the muscles of the body. I thought that it was just pretty cool knowing those things. And um, because I love fitness and I love going to the gym, I think it helps me a lot in that area too. Just knowing your body. Hmm. 600, 600 hours. hours. So uh, how many, was it like, how long did that take for you to accomplish? Like how many, was it like Not too years? much. It wasn't too bad. It was about six months. Six months. I'm bad yeah. at math. That's like a hundred month, hundred hours a, a month. Month. Yeah. So God, I hope I'm not wrong either. I think it was about six months. It was about eight hours a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then you have to take um, a test there to pass the class and then a test at state board. Okay. Um, so estheticians, I know they do a lot. Um, what do you, what services do you offer as an esthetician? Well, at one point I had an in-home um, facial room. So I did facials and waxing and eyebrows and uh, thinking what else do estheticians do? love removing pimples. I didn't think I would love doing it as much as I do. Um, and then eventually I got so busy in the makeup world. Thankfully my career took off that I really didn't have time to do that anymore. And I actually have another little side business. I run it. I run a little vegan bakery out of my kitchen and I try to give that as much time too. But I feel like each one of those things requires so much of your attention that they just kind of end up being side hustles. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you run a vegan bakery. Silly question, but are you vegan? I was, I was vegan for quite some time. And then when I got pregnant with my son, my doctor said that um, I need to consume either fish or eggs for for some vitamins that I wasn't receiving. So I started eating eggs and I think I just never went back to being vegan, but I'm still a vegetarian. Okay. All right. We have um, a lot of vegetarian options at where I work. Um, I know. That's why I love it. <laughs> yeah. So how long have, how long have you been, were you vegan slash vegetarian for? I want to say now about seven years. Seven years. What made you want to transition from eating animal products to vegan slash vegetarian? I took a trip to Thailand and at one of the elephant sanctuaries, I was helping bathe a baby elephant. And I think just looking into his eyes and realizing that it's a sentient being and as are cows and pigs and whatnot, I think at that moment, I decided that I do not want to consume it anymore. So Mm -hmm. I did that and still was able to do CrossFit, still was able to gain muscle, a little different, had to change my diet around and try to figure out how to get protein in still. Um, But nothing changed. I felt like it actually helped keep my skin looking good. And yeah, I feel pretty healthy seven years later. Yeah, you look pretty healthy, and I couldn't tell your age. I was like, oh, wow, you know. Uh, so I remember I went vegan in 2009 for a summer for a girl. She was cute. Oh, yeah? Give a shot. Yeah. Um, I worked at Chipotle at the time, so it wasn't too hard. I mean, I had a free meal every day at work, so I just got the ve- veggie bowl. Looking back in hindsight, it wasn't really too bad. It's yeah. just, I don't know, attending family parties was a bit difficult. I think now yeah. it's more acceptable, but my grandma was tripping and she was like, you don't like my cooking. Yeah. You know, I feel like I offended her. Are there a lot of um, vegetarian slash vegan options in um, Persian dishes? I think now I, I found a little bit more, but at the time, because the main item on our table 
for dinners was usually meat. That that was a center focus of the meals. And then of course there was like rice or salad that would go with it. So it was difficult at first. And yeah, my family was, they were trying to be supportive, but also found it silly and were very concerned that I was going to get really sick or really thin. And, and none of those things happened. I did not get really thin <laughs> or sick from it. But now my mom is also, she's become pescatarian about two years after I became vegan and she does just fine. And my son is pescatarian. And I think the only person now in my household, and I say household because I live on my parents' property in a back house is uh, my dad. He's the only one that eats meat. So I'll eat okay. with him sometimes. Right. She'll try to cover him once in a while. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think the studies are out there that if you consume too much red meat, it can have detrimental health effects. Yeah. I remember that was a big thing, but um, yeah. But then I remember, so back to the, I was vegan for summer. I got drunk. I started eating in, in and out like towards the end of the summer. <laughs> That's and how it there, happens. And then, and then like I went to, I had a food nutrition class in CSUN and they were like mm. cooking up steak. And I'm like, you know, I can't pass this up. Wow, really? You know? Yeah, I was just saying like, oh, how you can cook a steak in different ways, like microwave, like grilling, all that stuff. Ooh, um, boy. Yeah, I I don't think it turned out too well. Okay, oh, so, I wouldn't. Yeah, it would probably take a long time and it would be cooked properly. Um, so also too, when we were message, messaging each other about um, this podcast, you told me that you went on an ayahuasca trip. Uh, can you talk to us more about what it was like and why you went? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, had gotten to a point in my early 30s that I had always dealt with depression, but I think it really hit rock bottom in my early 30s. And maybe some of it came from culturally not being where I'm supposed to be married in my career with children, whatnot, all those things that were expected of me. So I got super depressed and I lost my purpose. And it was so bad that I had gotten to the point where I started thinking about um, transferring whatever savings I had over to my sister and really just ending my life. And I was listening to actually a podcast with uh, Joe Rogan. I listened to that often back in the day and they were talking about ayahuasca and I was like, okay, I'm going to look into this. And I did, I looked into it and I found a place in Peru, uh, booked it, went out there and I told myself, you know, if this doesn't work, what, what do you have to lose? If you still want to end your life, you can do so. So I went out there and met with some really incredible people and did, uh, I believe it was uh, five days of ayahuasca and one day of San Pedro. And it was definitely nothing I was expecting and uh, super scary and incredible and wonderful. And I do feel like it saved my life. Um, I felt like each night and each ceremony I was going through or working through something in my life and they would last up to 12 hours for me, which was a long time, but you do, you do kind of start to uh, time and space gets a little bit skewed for you. So I just, I thought it was incredible. There was a lot of crying, a lot of seeing uh, the first night it was me seeing myself as a baby in my mom's arms. And I was sitting outside of a home looking in like into the window and watching my mom with me and realizing that even if she wasn't the best mom ever, she was a loving mom. So it helped work through some of those things. And I just felt like each night I was facing new demons. And at the end of it, you really realize the only demon is yourself because you create these perspectives that are dark and imprisoning. And really, you, the, the sentence, uh, you are your own worst enemy, couldn't be truer when you do ayahuasca. And um, yeah, it was absolutely a beautiful experience. 
I remember there was one night where I had asked if um, what my purpose is. I really wanted to know before I went into this, into this, I guess, trance, if you would. And at some point I saw my body turn lizard-like and all of a sudden um, it turned into like this, well, there was like these aliens almost standing around me. And as I'm freaking out, that my skin is turning lizard like and my hands are becoming like like a lizard. They were laughing at me and they were saying that uh you humans always take the tiniest problems and you make them so big and, and you think you're the center of the universe. And I just remember them saying this to me and laughing at me. And then I heard this really beautiful feminine voice saying that if you want the pain to go away, just let go. So I did. And I allowed my body to turn into whatever it was and I didn't fight it. And I relaxed and then my body turned into this like grid of light. And it felt like I was ascending. And as I'm ascending, she asks me, do you want to see the, the color of your soul? And of course I said, yes. So as she said that, there was just like, she was like creating this like ball with her hand and she threw it into the universe and it exploded into a million stars and she was like that is your soul you are so much more than your body you are so much more than your problems and i guess the the whole lesson there was just let go of the small shit let go of the big shit too and just allow things to move through you because sometimes it's just necessary. It's necessary for you to transition. And it was beautiful. It was a lot of tears, a lot of crying that night. Wow. Thank you for sharing. That was, that's intense. Five nights. Um, out of curiosity, is it, is ayahuasca something you ingest? Is it like a liquid or something you smoke? Yeah, it's it's a liquid, and I believe that it comes from the ayahuasca tree and then another plant in which they, uh, I want to say they boil it together for some amount of time until it uh, changes consistency, and then they turn it into a tea. And it tastes horrible. Absolutely, it tastes like an ashtray. Not that I've ever tasted an ashtray, but I feel like if I ever did, this is what it would taste like. Um and I only needed a very little amount. Everybody else took took larger amounts, but it was just affecting me so hard that they yeah, adjusted the dosage for me. Okay. Well, I like. Thank you for sharing what you what you experienced. I mean, those are people to them saying, you know, don't sweat the small stuff. Uh, essentially, it's what it is. You know, learning to let go. Um, it's very beautiful, and you came out seemed like a lot better. Um, yeah, yeah, depression is real. Uh, right now I'm tapering off antidepressants. It was not a big oh, really? dose. Yeah. Yeah. I, I initially got them because I was into drugs for a cool minute, pretty long time. And mm -hmm. when I stopped six months in, my dopamine was kind of off balance. And, um, my sponsor suggested I see a, a psychiatrist because, What's the point of staying clean if you're not happy? And I was doing all the step work, doing everything good, but it's just wasn't doing too well in a sense for like I wasn't very social or anything. So now it's been a few months kind of tapering off them because that was the plan. The goal wasn't to like be on it for forever, just a short amount of time. So I'm feeling like not the best sometimes, but I'm just managing, but I'm going to give it some more time and see maybe if I can do it a little longer because it, it kind of sucks. Maybe it's the weather, but lately it's just been feeling like I don't feel like I'm doing much lately. Like I don't feel like doing a lot of stuff when I get off work. I just chill in my room. Maybe it's the weather. It's been not sunny lately. Yeah. I just sleep at like 6 p.m. But then I have a morning shift, so like early morning shift, so it doesn't matter. But yeah, yeah, so I, I can relate with that. You may be one of those people that just thrive in sunshine. I feel like that's me. Sunshine really changes my mood. And when it, when it isn't there, I just kind of hibernate or yeah. go 
go into myself. Possibly. I mean, I can see it. Um, I used to love overcast weather. I don't know what happened. I think I was always on drugs. Like, oh, it's a perfect time to get high kind of thing. So it didn't bother me. But mm-hmm. now I'm not. It's like, well, because I like the great, I like the overcast because you can't tell if it's like daytime or nighttime kind of. It's just this like, I don't know, midday mm-hmm. kind of thing. I, I don't want to feel so guilty when I see the sun go up and go down. But that could be it. Definitely. What kind of drugs were you on, if you don't mind me asking? Um, I was, you know, surprisingly, I was never into psychedelics too much because I felt like deep down in the back of my mind, I was like, I am not okay. I think my con- subconscious knew, like, I don't know, looking at it now, I was like, dude, you're taking a bunch of drugs, man. You're not okay. And I know no. the thing about, yeah, the thing about what I heard with like mushrooms and all that, like acid. You have to be in a good mindset. So I never took those too much. I did it once or twice. Didn't like them. But I was in the uppers for the most part. I got into E. And then um, Mm -hmm. I got into, let's see, like downers for a little bit. I started taking like oxys and stuff. And that became Mm -hmm. expensive. So we got into, we wanted to become economically friendly. So we switched to lactar, um, smoking it. And yeah. then, um, yeah. And then, uh, so that was, that was like the gamut of it. You know, drinking was a big part of it. I just think, you know, you turn 18, I went to college and it's like, this is the thing to do. You know, I've seen like super bad. I've seen animal house, all these like movies that portray alcohol as like part of the culture. And it really is in a lot of cultures, but I took it. I was drinking a lot. I think just to mask a lot of like childhood stuff and just past things. Mm-hmm. And um, I black out a lot. I stopped drinking heavily around 27 because I realized the hangovers weren't worth it. But I justified to myself, well, hey, congratulations. You're not blacking out anymore when you're drinking. You're not losing your keys. You're not doing all that stuff. You're not getting into fights okay. with people. You can do more drugs now. It's okay. You know, <laughs> that was my <laughs> justification. I switched from one drug to I love that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, looking back, alcohol did the nut. The worst on me like out of all the drugs surprisingly dude like i don't know i don't know if you're a drinker but dude it just the hangovers are gnarly yeah i uh i have to plan my drinks like six months at a time where i'm like okay this night i will have alcohol and this after that two or three days i will recover <laughs> and then i will go back to work because i just don't metabolize it like i used to and it, I think with, again, okay, how you said with like depression, it can definitely just knock you down. And I was a heavy drinker at one point. And when I say heavy, I don't mean I drank every day, but when I drank, I drank to point of oblivion and um, actually ended up going to the hospital for it one time, which was a crazy experience for me. But I, I remember being, I drank so much at this party uh, somebody called an ambulance to get, because they, I wouldn't, I was unconscious. And uh, the next day I remember opening my eyes and thinking to myself, cause everything was so blurry and bright. I thought, Oh shit, I killed myself. And I was just kind of floating. That's what it felt like. I was floating and it felt really warm and it felt really nice. Like, like I guess what people describe as being in a womb would be like, I thought, okay, well, I did it. I killed myself. I guess now I have to brace myself for what's coming. And these were real thoughts going through my head. And at that point, I see this kind of white light float near me. And I said, I remember out loud saying, oh, are you God? And the voice said, no, Miss Yaki, I am your doctor. And right there, I felt like somebody slammed my body back down or my soul back down into my body and started feeling the most excruciating pain and nausea and headache. And then of course, throat ache because they had pumped my stomach. So I could feel it in my throat. It was all scratched up. But just that, that transition from feeling so incredible and believing that I was dead to all of a sudden knowing that I was alive and that duality of kind of bliss and pain 
it was just the strangest experience. And sometimes I think maybe I was ready to leave my body and maybe I was ready to die. And that doctor might have interrupted it. I don't know. It could be crazy. Somebody that's into science might think I'm crazy, but I, I think back on it and I really think that that might have been the case. I feel like he interrupted me death. Interesting. Was this before or after the ayahuasca trip? Probably before. This is before. This is when I was like okay. 19. Okay. Okay. I remember mm-hmm. drinking. I never drank to that point, but I would black out constantly. I, I mean, I think I caught something when you were saying about like, you're drinking to oblivion. In my head, I was like, isn't that the point? Like, I don't drink for taste. Um, I would drink. You don't want to have one What's that? I didn't hear the last thing you said. You said, oh, drink to I said I would, oh, I, w- I wouldn't drink for taste. I mean, it tasted good. So th- the thing was, you know, I would get like a beer, you know, at a restaurant or something. And there'd be two beers, three beers, maybe like two and a half beers in. I'm sending a text message to my connect, like, oh, like, were you around, you know? And then it would just go from there. So yeah. I can't even drink alcohol just because I just know myself, like, I just know, mm-hmm. you know, if I do, I'll, I'll I'll go back to what I was doing and I wouldn't really like it. So good on you for just going on the ayahuasca trip. Um, I have a buddy of mine that went to Peru for an ayahuasca trip uh, around like 2012, 2013. It was to uh, deal with like ADHD, depression. Um, addiction um i don't i haven't keep kept in touch with her but when she came back she felt like looked like it felt like a different person in a good way so uh, yeah is that yeah um, I mean, you still have to put so, the work into it i think yeah some people might think that it's you know, this like magic thing that you can do when come back and you're great again but you know i still deal with depression i still deal with dark thoughts now it's um I have some tools that can help me cope and get through them. And I feel like I did get that from ayahuasca. Um, but yeah, like the depression, it doesn't, doesn't go away completely. I feel like maybe it's just right. a chemical imbalance for me or uh, right. part of my identity sometimes. Yeah, no, um, for me too. I, I don't personally, I don't believe addiction can be cured. I mean, you can great. I just don't want to go like risk trying to find out other ways of doing it. Like what I mm-hmm. program my work, it's like a very slow and steady, you know, should takes a lifetime. I'm cool with that. I took a bunch of shortcuts in the past. I mean, if people can go on high water trips and like say they're cured from, from drugs. Great. I just feel like I would go purposely so I can say, oh, I'm cured of drugs so I can do drugs again. You know, I just have this mm-hmm. certain mindset. My buddy told me about like neural map, neural map linking or something where you can like reprogram your mind f- for triggers. Cause I told them, yeah, it's weird. I get triggered by EDM music and watching EDM um, shows because the whole time I, I've been watching those and listening to those, I was on E the whole time, like in my early mm-hmm. 20s. So now when I listen to it, it sounds cool, but I get like a little, I don't know, my, 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 my hands get a little sweaty and my heart rate goes up a yeah. little bit. And he goes, yeah, you know, you can like reprogram your mind. And I'm like, you know, I'm sure that worked for you. And it seems like it does. It did for you. But for me, I think if I had that mindset, oh, I can reprogram my mind. That means I can reprogram my addiction. It don't exist. I'm going to get high again. You know, there's just like a really weird yeah. thought process I have. Well, that's a really interesting way of looking at it, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, very cool. Thank you for sharing your experience with the Wasi trip and what it's done. And I'm glad you're here. Right. You know, I feel like a lot of people are Thanks. very glad you're here. It seems Thank like you. you've grew, grown a lot from that experience. Okay. I feel like so, have, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, okay. I'm smiling right now. So, I checked, you know, I remember I got your Instagram. Uh, at work. Check your Instagram. You said you're a makeup artist. I started scrolling. Okay, 
you do good makeup. I, I like this. I'm like, wait a minute. These women look kind of familiar. Mm -hmm. Huh. And I clicked. I'm like, oh, that's who I think it is. <laughs> Dude, yeah. I'm like, wait. I was like, I felt it was like on some starstruck shit. Like, you know how people like idolize like celebrities, you know? Yeah. I don't idolize like adult actresses, but I'm like, oh, wow. That's, you know who? You know, so I yeah. was like, wow, you met so and so. Okay. So you're you do makeup for the in a, in the adult industry how did that come about so about i want to say 16 something years ago i have a friend that i grew up with his name is bear and i called him up one time because i knew that he was in uh production management in adult films and i don't know what it is about the sex industry i've always found it fascinating even as a kid, I just thought it was fascinating, that whole world. And I knew nothing about it. And maybe that's what fascinated me or drew, drew me to it. But I asked him if he can get me in, and he did. And I've been there ever since. And I was horrible in the beginning. I was a terrible makeup artist, but um, I was a really fun person to be around. I was nice, and, and I liked everybody. So I think maybe that somewhat helped me stick around and I just uh I did it until I feel like I got good enough to be proud of my work and I'm still there I was there all week and I love it I love my job I love the people I work with I have such an affinity towards most of these women because they've become such good friends of mine and they're just incredible. And I think the fact that they're so sexually free is fascinating to me. Growing up in kind of an oppressed culture, I just, I find them, I find them like stars. I love staring at them. They're beautiful and they're wonderful. I couldn't say enough nice things about these women and men. The men are incredible too. Right. Yeah, I, I like what you said, but they are free, you know, liberated, where society kind of looks down upon them. I give them props. I mean, I, I think there's always been that negative connotation, but now with online, you see a lot of, like, hate towards, like, women who are in the sex work industry or adult industry, and it just really upsets me because mm -hmm. I think, like, you know, it's their choice for the most part, I want to say. I'm pretty sure there are certain cases where it's not their choice, but Maybe it's an assumption saying that for the most part, they enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's their right as a, as a woman, as an adult to do what they want with their body, as long as it's consensual. And yeah. I just think it's great that they're liberated in that sense. And it just really upsets me again, just seeing people saying, Oh, father, fatherless behavior, this and that. I'm like, dude, motherless behavior on you because your mom didn't teach you that women should have the choice and you should respect it, what they want to do with their body, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's beautifully said. Yeah. And a lot of these women, like you said, they get so much hate and so much discrimination for what? For the movies you're watching, for the movies that you're promoting, like you're paying their bills. On, we're such a doubly moral country. On one side, we, we want to do everything that we want to do under uh, behind closed doors and then the, the other side in public we want to chastise these people for for what sex like we're such a sex obsessed country i think and um again goes back to whose mind is the dirtiest here the, the one obsessed with the idea or the one that's just making a living off of it um these girls are incredible Incredible. I have the most wonderful conversations with them in my chair. And yeah, some of them do come from trauma, but 90% of my friends come from trauma and they're doctors and they're lawyers and they work in finance. So I don't think it necessarily is a um, like, oh, if you're, if you're in porn, you came from trauma. It, it doesn't always go hand in hand. It can be mutually exclusive. Right. Yeah, well yeah, man. I mean, I just think like they're, it's it's a job for them. And I, I really th think that you have a great like what you do is great because you see them outside of the camera, you know, because I feel like a lot of people just 
see them as that as doing sex scenes and everything but they have lives outside of it and i think it's really cool that you get a glimpse into their lives yeah and some of them are so talented outside of that industry they have the most beautiful voice or they play an instrument or they paint or they have just they garden there's so many fantastic talents that they have that separate them from just that and i feel like with porn your job is your identity but i mean people that work in banks it's not like their job is their identity so being able to separate that one is a career and one is an identity and the career is just part of that it's not the entirety of it right yeah well said um and it just sucks how like when other when actresses or people in the adult industry try to transition outside of work outside of work outside of that industry like you know they get shamed oh like you were so-and-so like i don't know they get shamed for it like they work at starbucks or like a restaurant and then people find out and they kind of like give them shit for it and it's kind of like i don't know it's just really frustrating yeah it it really kind of blows my mind why what is it even about that that you're so obsessed with that you want to give this person any crap for it like i have a a couple that come to a couple of people that come to my gym and i try to keep it very quiet on what they are i mean outside of that uh what they do excuse me not what they are and um i have to do that so that there's not this weird treatment of them or some parent saying oh i don't want my kid there and it's like what are you talking about because they do porn automatically you think they have a eyes on your kid it that that stretch is so mind-boggling to me um i've heard of girls getting kicked out of their apartment buildings by the landlord because they are found out or girls losing their um their day job because the boss found out and i still won't understand it because if you found out then by some degree of separation you watched it so why is it okay for you to jerk off to it but you don't want it anywhere around you as far as like oh this person did that well it's it's mind-boggling i couldn't agree agree more with what you're saying i mean yeah i mean in a sense you must have found out you must have looked and checked so in a sense you're in you're you're, in a sense you're like complicit in the cycle you know yeah it really it's really upsetting um Okay, so I remember at work, won't say who, maybe I'll tell you outside of out this when we hang up or whatever. Um, there was, there's an adult actress that I recognize. She came in a couple of times. The first time I'm like, I wonder if that's her, you know? Second time, I just, you know, she was in passing. Oh, like, I, I kind of like kept it low key. I'm like, hey, uh, I don't make a big deal, but I'm a big fan of your work, this and that. And she goes, you want a hug? I'm like, okay, sure. You know? I rang her up. Cool. Never saw her again, but yeah. Yeah. And I think she probably appreciated the fact that you did keep it low key and it was just a compliment. It's, um, it's really scary how some people will watch this stuff and not separate the person from the movie and really think that maybe they possess this girl or they have the right to touch her butt or they have the right to say something very inappropriate. It's the same as if somebody works in horror movies. Like, do you think now their identity is always horror and you always have to approach it from that, from that aspect? Um, but they are so much diff- so much more than what people think they are. And she was sweet. She gave you a hug. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't expecting it. I was kind of like, uh, like, I have to, but okay. You know, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying that, you know, it's like movies. I mean, you wouldn't approach like Sean Reeves thinking, oh, that's Neo from the Matrix. Let's treat him like Neo in the Matrix. <laughs> yeah. Or that's you John know? Wick. I'm going to kill him and make some money. I think you wouldn't do yeah. that. <laughs> and, yeah. I just, and I feel like with, adult actresses or people in the industry that like that's a movie it's scripted to a degree 
And when I'm pretty sure when it's the scene is done, it's done. And it's like, you can't, done. Mm-hmm. there's like, there's maybe there's not that, like that, that like buffer, you know, I don't think people who watch those movies, see the, the beginning parts as like, these are actors is sensual, you know, they'll just say a lot of vile things that they might see in those movies, but it's a movie. It's not really got to treat people with respect. Absolutely. This is still a person. This is still someone that has bills just like you, maybe kids just like you, and they're just trying to make a living. They just happen to do it in an industry that is kind of fascinating to a lot of us. And I think if we just started looking at it as it is fascinating, whether you think it's disgusting or not, it still fascinates you because you, your mind is on it. And um, it would be nice to just treat these women with, like like you said, the respect that they deserve and what they don't see. They might see like a rough scene or something, but what the normal audience isn't seeing is the consent that we do before that scene starts. And that is going through every tiny nuance of what both parties are okay with once that camera turns on. And once the camera turns on, if they're not okay with it, they have the right to say, hey, stop, I'm not okay with this. And I think that we do need to incorporate that, which we are a little bit more into these movies. So people see there is consent from the very beginning to the very end. This isn't Again, like a horror movie, when someone's running from the monster, there was consent that this person wanted to be there and to run and to play scared, to pretend to be scared. Um, doesn't mean when the, you see them in public that you should chase them. Because now that that's what they've consented universally to everybody. But I think if you, if yeah. people just start looking at it as just a movie, it, there would be a lot more, um, realism towards it right well said um i think that kind of tackles like what the qu- next question was just the misconceptions of you know working in the in the adult industry you know um I, outside of what we just talked about are there any other misconceptions that con folk like myself might think goes on but doesn't or vice versa Yeah, I think one of the biggest ones may be that um, people automatically assume the word dirty uh, at any capacity, like people are diseased or they're dirty or the set must be dirty or even my products must be dirty because I use on them. And that's such a juvenile way to look at them, uh, look at those things, because that word can can mean so many different things as far as like STDs and STIs, they're tested sometimes more it's usually about once every two weeks but sometimes more than that and the regular the general public there are so many people that i know that have actually never tested because they think that they're okay and they don't have any diseases because they don't feel sick and we've been told time and time again from classes to to anywhere you learn about this stuff that you're not always going to have a symptom and you could still be spreading so as far as that, they're always tested, not to say that they don't catch things. Sure, they do, just like the general public, but they also are aware of it and they um, take the medication for it. Um, I think another misconception is uh, drugs and alcohol are served on set and these girls are forced to be there and they're minors and that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, we run like any corporate business runs. We have a code of conduct. We have um, consent. We have no drugs or alcohol allowed on set. And if you seem inebriated, you're going to get sent home because you're at work and you're not supposed to be inebriated. Um, Are some people, do some people smoke weed before they come in? Sure. But I feel like you're a little bit, you can be more functional. But if it's apparent that you're high, you get sent home. Because nobody wants to deal with your regrets later because you were high and you didn't uh, consent to something of sound mind. Um, So that doesn't happen. And again, the consent thing where we sit down at a table and we film it and we, we have a line of questions that are asked of the two or how many ever are in the scene on what they're okay with. 
100%. And if you're even a little iffy about something, they delete it from the scene. You don't have to do it because you should want to be here and you should want to do it and have a good time doing it. Because if you don't, you can definitely go home and somebody that does enjoy it can be there. Um, you, you shouldn't have to do this because you feel like you have to. That doesn't mean that there aren't cases where people feel like they have to be there, but you usually can suss that out and you can get a feeling for it. And nobody wants to be on set with someone that feels like they have to be there. Nobody wants to be at work with someone that feels like they have to be there and has a bad attitude about it. Um, I know in our case, it's more than a bad attitude. You, you also do feel bad for the person like, hey, you don't have to be here. And if anyone's making you, please let us know so we can address that. But that that doesn't really happen. Um, all the girls and all the guys are of age, over 18, and two forms of IDs are always checked. So I remember there was this one girl that was telling me, well, what if they fake their ID? And I said, well, you know, it's kind of hard because you, you can tell if it's two forms of fake IDs. And she just kept like pressing the question. And finally, I was like, look, if a 17-year-old is so intelligent that they can fake two forms of IDs and want to be there, I just say, let them be there. What do you want me to do? I mean, of course, I don't really think that way, but eventually I had to just drop it by telling her she's right. But yeah, yeah everyone. I mean, is... I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, um, like with my work, I don't work in that industry, but. I work in a store where I card people if they buy alcohol. I mean, there was one time where this kid, I mean, he looked like a fake ID, but what I do, I'm not the police. You know, it was a legit, but like it looked iffy. But yeah, I mean, two forms of ID, that's like, that's really difficult to do. And I'm glad you shared with us the process and the and how strict it is in the working conditions because there is that like, oh, you know, it's like, it's not professional. It's unclean when it really is. You get tested uh, rigorously. You, you know, like you said with the policy with alcohol and drugs. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's not tolerated and that's good. And I think uh, that's good. You shared that. Thank you. I mean, at least I know that with our crew, our set, it's never tolerated because again, who wants to be at work with someone who's drunk, no matter what the, uh, the work is. You don't want to be at work with someone who's drunk. You want to be able to, and we want to go home at the end of the day. We have kids, yeah. we have gyms, we have other jobs. Maybe we have other things we need to do. Families. We don't want to stay there all day. So show up, show up on time, clean, ready to go, sober, so we can get this done and go home right. and then live to work another day. Yeah. And I like what you said about the consent thing too, with sitting down with them and seeing what they're okay with, what they're not. I think that's really important for the audience to hear. Um, well, I think that's about it. That was a quick hour. I learned a lot. Thank you. That went by really fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, even to this day, I'm still a little nervous in the beginning, but I flew by. Thank you for sharing um, your knowledge, you know, your experience with the working in the adult industry, you know, your upbringing, um, how it influenced you to get tattoos you know, the mental health stuff and ayahuasca trips, being a makeup artist and all that. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed speaking with you about all these things today.